Welcome back to Presidents in Politics. I'm one of your hosts, Caleb McGee, joined with former Congressman uh, Professor Ross. Yes, yes. Our uh, former morning. host, our current host. It's been, yes. a long, it's been a long day yes. already. It's Monday morning, and it's already <laughs> been a long day. Well, we'll keep them all lively today. With We're going to keep them rolling. James K. Polk. Yes, the most... Remembered of the forgotten presidents. That's a good way to put it, yeah. right? And the most successful one-term president of all time. True. He got more done in four years. Domestically, he absolutely did. Yes, which than was any other amazing. president. Yes, and and a great background. You know, again, we, we look at these these presidents that um, we've been reviewing and their education, and, and he came from a fairly well-to-do family, mm -hmm. um, had some health issues as a child. But what I think is fascinating is that um, he graduated from, I guess it was the University of North Carolina, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Latin studies, and he gave the commencement address in Latin. Yes. I just can't imagine sitting through that. <laughs> <laughs> who would who would challenge him? I, you Were know, there that many Latin people out there that you know Latin students. The that would classical. Say? That's one thing we've talked about a lot is this idea of classical education. If you look yes. at what he studied, it was it was Greek, it was Latin, it was philosophy, it was mathematics. Yeah. And then you look at the individuals who come through our education system today, who reach the top, and they're very very narrow minded. And they know about three things. And this idea of not only reading deeply, but reading broadly has been lost yes. in the modern American education system. Yeah, he was big into mathematics and Latin. Yes. And, you know, and he had a, an interest in politics, and, and he pursued that. Single-mindedly. Very much so. Yeah, it was said of him that he had no hobbies, no interest, no life outside of politics. And I, and I think as we, when we, when we conclude this today, we'll, we'll, we'll give the example of why that probably cost him his life. Yes. You know, I mean, he was a very determined man. At age 27, is elected to the Tennessee legislature mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and spends one term and then goes into the United States Congress. Yeah. Yes. And, and he spends seven terms there. But what was fascinating about his time in Congress is that he was pretty he was pretty successful. He was. You know, he spent two terms as Speaker of the House. Mm hmm. He was pretty politically savvy. Very politically savvy. And, they, you know, he was such a great orator. I think they called him the Napoleon of the Stump. Yes. And and uh, he was, as a communicator, which, please, understand, communication is so important. The most critical. It, it doesn't matter whether you're in politics, if you're in healthcare, if you're just in social work, whatever it is, communication, communication, and in a good marriage, because I work <laughs> on it all the time. <laughs> yes. And, I always tell my students that, that no matter what you learn in college, learn how to communicate well. Yes. Learn how to speak well. Learn how to read well. Learn how to write well and if you can do those three skills amen you're gonna be okay in life you're gonna probably be a leader in life too readers are leaders right they used to say all yes. the time when we were, we were kids and there's a lot of truth in that and and what i've discovered is that the more you read the more well read you are typically the better speaker you become i think you're right the more the better of a communicator i, I you think become. you're right and i don't know if it's because your subconscious just really absorbs all that you're reading and knows when to trigger the the, the responses based on the knowledge that you've gained through all the reading but it's amazing that the more you do read the better you become I, as, as an orator Yes, I fully agree. It was actually said of him that he was introverted. He'd better be left alone with his books and study. Um, and one biography or said this, and I really like this, political nature forced him to mingle. Yes. So he was one who didn't necessarily like the idea of being in the the balls and the parties and the state dinners. Well, and, 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 and let me just analogize that to present day when you look at uh, Governor Ron DeSantis. Good you analogy. Know, he, he, people have, have commented, and I served with Ron, uh, you know, he's not, the, he's a very introverted person. Mm -hmm. He's not a people person like his protege, Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And when you look at this, and I think this is the, another neat analogy, is that uh, Andrew Jackson kind of uh, took, mentored yes. uh, James Polk and, and, and helped lead him. And, and he became, in the legislature, in the Congress, Polk became, you know, the, the leader for the Jacksonian agenda. Mm -hmm. And it's not unlike what we have here today. You know, if it weren't for Donald Trump, you wouldn't have a Ron DeSantis. That's a good and, analogy. And that's, I, I think, you know, history does have a tendency to repeat itself. And yes. one of the attributes that, that James K. Polk had is that he tied himself to the right political people Young of the time. Young Hickory, they called him. Young Hickory, After you're right. old Hickory. Yeah. And, uh, and he supported expansionism. He supported, uh, uh, you know, the the the, the um, independence of the the treasury as yes. well as no national bank. So he was he was really setting forth the Jacksonian agenda when he was Speaker of the House. What was fascinating, I think, is also the Speaker of the House, is that he imposed the gag rule, yes. which which prohibited the discussion of slavery yes. in Congress. 
I mean, and it was it was a question in many ways to the constitutionality of that law. Is this prohibiting First Amendment rights? Right. And I guess for opponents or really his proponents, they would say, well, it's almost like the military where you voluntarily give up certain constitutional rights for public service. Right. What he would say is you're voluntarily giving up some of your rights for public service. And that's an interesting, that's a constitutional law argument right there. Like, where do we go? The How constitutional was this? Obviously taking the ethics of slavery out because I think right. slavery is wrong. Absolutely. But how, how, how actually ethical or how legal was this gag rule as a president? How many of your natural rights do you give up in order to serve in public service? Today, I can tell you none. <laughs> and it would, you know, as a former member of Congress, if I was told I cannot speak about something, especially on the floor of the House, mm. you know, absent, you know, just outrageous, you know, demagoguery that's, that's false and, and insightful, I, I would say that's just in, inappropriate and yes, wrong. Yes, I agree. And, you know, the other thing is, and part of his agenda was that he he, he administered the, the the Trail of Tears, the Indian mm. Removal Act. Mm. Again, a, a uh, uh, an agenda item of President Andrew Jackson. Yes. And, and that was just a, a black eye. Absolutely. A terrible, terrible um, time, per, time period for the United States. But he was the one that marshaled it through Congress. Yes. And yeah. Through the House. We might as well deal with the... Uh, the elephant in the room, and that's his idea of manifest destiny, yes. right? This He believes, and, and so did Southern Democrats, so mm-hmm. it starts with Jackson, even Van Buren to an extent, and then now we find with Polk, they have this I- ideology of manifest destiny that God has ordained uh, the American government to basically own all of North America from sea yep, to, to the sea. Atlantic to the Pacific. Yes, and and this is this is in, there's so many places we could go with this. Honestly, it, it's interesting to think about because was it right for America to to slaughter indigenous people groups? Obviously, it was not. No. Was it right to hold minorities in slavery? Obviously, it was not. There were a lot of it was it was an evil, wrong thing, but a lot of people live in in left leaning states and their whole time they're complaining that America owns this territory while they're still living in that territory, which seems a bit hypocritical to me. Um, And the one thing I often often wonder is, had America not increased and taken, through Manifest Destiny, this idea of the entire continent, would those areas be more free today, or they have more freedom today? That's a good question. Would we, would they all be the United States today? You know, would we have separate countries? I I don't know. I would, I would tend to think that that, that, that they would become ultimately part of the United States, just not as through vicious and, and, um, um, terrible warfare that we had. But you're right. The Manifest Destiny actually distinguished him to become the dark horse candidate yes, for president. And, absolutely. You know, he, he after he... But what I like, I, I think is fascinating, is that, that after he serves in Congress for seven terms, he comes back and has become governor of the state of Tennessee and then serves one term, loses re-election, and then loses another run for, for governor of Tennessee. <laughs> And then he's nominated by the Democrat Party because Van Buren can't get on board. They can't find the right person to 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 propose the the annexation of Texas and, and the expansion, westward expansion of America. And he comes out of the top of the ticket. And the Whig Party, who he's run, running against, starts his mockery campaign of yes. who is James K. Polk. Well, James K. Polk, uh, I think, used that to his his advantage because he was a stalwart about you know Western expansion. Yes, and 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 that actually catapulted him to become president of the United States. And interestingly enough, he actually believed that through manifest destiny, through this westward expansion, he was bringing freedom and liberty to a ragged land. And again, this yes. this, this is just an interesting thing the to end handle. The ends justify the means. The yep. ends did justify the means. Because think about when, when Santa Ana, who of course was, was the political yep. leader of Mexico, which granted he'd been disenfranchised by the time of the Texas Rebellion, but that's a whole other thing. Santa Ana had already made the statement about his Mexican territory that his people would not experience freedom for like four generations. Right. So he's already saying that he plans to remain almost a despot of sorts over this territory. When America takes the the Mexican territory, which is now California, Wyoming, New Mexico, Arizona, right. Utah, all, why, this yep. entire massive swath of land, one of the things that's granted is all Mexican citizens are allowed to stay where they are and keep their land. And that way their children will become American citizens. So there is an amazing opportunity given. However, the way it was taken probably wasn't. So it's, it's one of those things you have to grapple with but, in history. Like, yes. was this a good thing? Well, we went about it the wrong way. But was the end result actually giving more freedom and liberty as Polk thought it did? Possibly. Well, let's 
let, let's think about that because you know Tyler uh, John Tyler, whose predecessor, mm-hmm. uh, actually annexes Texas, and then then um, James K. Polk says, "Well, I want to go and negotiate the rest of the Mexican territory, which includes California, Arizona, sends, New Mexico." Sly, Slyville, Sly- yeah, yeah, yeah. And he sends you know, an, uh, an entourage with an offer of twenty million dollars yes. to buy it, mm-hmm. and the Mexican government says, "No way, we're not going to do this." So Polk sends General Zachary Taylor down and starts the Mexican-American War, which General Ulysses Grant ultimately said that that was probably the most useless war we've ever had. <laughs> yes, he did. But, you know, and you, to get to your point is that ultimately after the Americans push back the, the Mexicans and the Mexicans, you know, agree and, and, and give up, we give them then $15 million, mm-hmm. another $3 million in reparations. Mm-hmm. We lose 12,000 Americans in the fight. Which most of that was a disease, the yeah, disease yeah. In, the, in the wilderness. It's not that they were necessarily a uh, superior F- fighting it, force. It was just you're on like you're on the Rio Grande, and yes. there's there's scorpions and spiders and heat that we weren't used to. And cholera is a huge outbreak problem with dirty yep. water. I mean, we still don't drink water when you go. So and, 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 and then and then it cost us. They say a hundred million dollars mm-hmm. just in defense. So you look at what happened. You know. We pushed back Mexico. We forced them to 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 give in, and and yet what we lost as Americans as well. Could diplomacy, if given time, have accomplished the same thing with less costs and less, you know, um, American lives? I don't know. But uh, ultimately, he set the borders, the greatest westward expansion ever, over yes. a million acres, mm-hmm. bigger than the Louisiana Purchase. Yes. Um, it it uh, added a third to the current size of the U.S., which yes. included the Louisiana Purchase. That's why, like you said, it's such a larger demographic. Yeah. And then as he's also taking Mexico to the south in this territory and to the west, then he negotiates with Britain to the yes, north. Yes, to the north. Yeah, 54, 40 or fight. Yes, exactly. That's the idea. You know? let's, let's argue over the parallel line. Mm-hmm. And uh, I believe it was also Polk made the statement that if a child had to cross the, the border four times to go to school, that was okay, but they were going to hammer that border out uh, with, with Canada, of course, modern-day Canada, which was Great Britain at right. the time. But he negotiated that. Yes, he, he did. was able to negotiate that. Yes, he was, because he did not want a two-front war. I mean, can you imagine if the U.S. would have been at war with Mexico to the south That's and then true. Britain to the north? We've already been at war with Britain now for the Revolutionary War in 1776 and then the War of 1812. Correct. And now to open a third time a war on a superpower when we were probably less prepared and then with a two-front war. Yes. What would have been the outcome of that? We may have we, lost all of the U.S. That's at that true. Point, or been pushed back to what, the original 13 colonies? I mean, there could have been. And just think of an alliance between Canada and Mexico and what other European countries would have oh want, gotten into that just to see our vulnerabilities exposed. Yes. So you got to give him credit for that. Although he was a slave owner and yes, although he was. in this expansion he did expand slavery yes, he did. throughout the United States. Yes, and, he did. And, and that that obviously wasn't a very good thing. Um, but. We are where we are because of his belief in manifest destiny, which is one thing I always tell my students. I just I find this interesting. I, I don't believe that what what he did was right. That's not what I'm saying. But when we look historically, as a history professor, when we look historically at certain empires, we always admire their their growth, their expansion, their ingenuity, their power, their promise. But when we look at America because it's so new, we always are like, well, I can't believe they did this. I can't believe they took that You're land. Right. And for some reason, there's almost a shame on the expansion of America that isn't carried over. Over to the Roman Empire or the Greek Empire True. or the Zulu Empire of Africa. We look at other conquering empires and we're like, man, what great, again, that goodness versus greatness, that yes, whole thing, which we went was through the goodness versus greatness. Again, yes. we, we look at the greatness of other empires, but for some reason when we come to America, we always have to look at the idea of what was morally wrong. And it was morally wrong. Absolutely. But also let's look at the greatness. This country expanded so rapidly that we took an entire continent in, 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 in less, years, less than 100 years. Yeah, it's amazing. That is an it? amazing thing. But again, not saying it was right, but can we at least just stop for a moment and just value the bigness of what took place. Absolutely. And it was true imperialism. I it mean, was you know, we, we were going in there forcing ourselves on Mexico, take it or leave yes. it. If you're not going to take it, we're coming after you. Uh, and, and, you know, in spite of ourselves, we were, we were successful in, in, in resolving it, but at what, at what cost? I agree. It, it, I always tell my students, cause I, I like to mess with their mind a little bit. And I always tell my students when we start dealing with, with con, uh, contemporary issues with political science, look at something like Afghanistan. When the U S was there, yes, there were atrocities going on, with what we did, but when we pulled out, look how much worse it became. It became. So at what point is this idea of American imperialism, and, and I'm not saying that American imperialism is good. I'm sure we get emails for this. Um, <laughs> but what I'm saying is like, at what point are we propagating freedom? And at what point, it, it's just, it's a slippery slope, isn't it? It is a very slippery and slope. And as someone who's served in Congress, I'm sure you've had to deal with these arguments of when we're there, we offer good things, but then sometimes taking it is a bad thing. So when does the 
the good yeah. justify it? Like, when does the end justify the means? What is the proper way that, of looking at this? That's a very good point. And when I was in Congress, I never had to vote on what we called the authorization of use of military force, mm-hmm. or an AUMF. That was done uh, right after 9-11, with that Congress did the authorization of use of military force to go into Afghanistan, uh, to go into um, uh, Iraq, and, and it, it, it stayed in place and was expanded more and more, but we never had to vote on it. It would have been probably one of the hardest and most sure. difficult votes I would have had to take to I'm put sure. America American lives at risk um, for what reason? Yes. You know, what is the national interest that we have there? And I'm sure that in, in Polk, Polk's time, he said the national interest is manifest destiny. Yes. We've got to expand. We've got to be able to go from from ocean to ocean, and that is in the best interest of this country. Um, today, I'm not so sure that would fly too well. I, I don't. But again, just from a, the the 37,000 foot flyover, a modern citizen living in Wyoming under the American rights and freedoms. Do they have a better life than they would have had if they were living under the modern Mexican government? It's true. Those are, I mean, and again, th- that's sticky. But you, you can't say things just by the means because we can't say we can wipe everyone out to get what we want. Like that it becomes very <laughs> Stalin, very Napoleon, very yes. like we, we don't want to become that. And I think that's the point that we have to continue to debate is, is that we'll never know. Yes. But we know that we can make things better because of the history that we've experienced. Agreed. And that's why we have to have these discussions of the atrocities. Yes. And we have to make sure that we don't let them repeat themselves. Good. And, and you know, when you look at even our, our work on trying to get back the, the, the uh, relations with our Indian tribes, Native American Indian mm-hmm. tribes, it's still very controversial. Yes, it is. Um, and, and, and our relations with Mexico are still controversial. But it, it, it's not going to eliminate the fact that it's an ongoing obligation for us to not only have a better society, but to work together with other nations to That's make good. a better society. That's good. And, and I, I think that Polk, I don't, know, I don't know what was going through his mind. All I know is this guy was a workaholic. <laughs> To the extreme. Yes, and he had no children. His wife, Sarah, mm-hmm. uh, who was, I understand, a brilliant lady. Yes, politically uh, savvy. Po- very politically. They mm-hmm. called her the presidentress or yes. something like that. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, and she, she, would, she, was, she redistinguished the, the, the role of the first lady. Probably the second one after Dolly Madison. Exactly. So. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, and she had, the, she had the, the political savvy of an Abigail Adams, too, I Agreed. think. And, and, but she, um, she was very Presbyterian at the time <laughs> and made sure that, you know, that there was no alcohol in the White House. Right. And on Sunday, they didn't have any music. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she was quite the hostess. And, and uh, bet- the two of them were a team. Yes. Um, yeah, he had a surgery when he was young to save his life. And yeah. most medical physicians believe it made him sterile, which is why they never had children. Yes. And he was single-minded and focused about politics and pretty much drove himself into an early grave, as you had mentioned earlier. Yeah. I, you know, what was it? You know, within four months yes. of leaving the White House, he died. He was the youngest president at the time at mm-hmm. 49. 49, well, yeah, yes. And then died at 53. 53. And he was the only president at the time who did not outlive his mother. His mother actually attended the funeral service wow, of a, of a president fresh out of office. Wow. And I'm sure that's happened since then. But at the time, that was the only only one. Yeah. Um, go back to the Mexican-American War. One of the really interesting things historically is the deception of Santa Ana. I'm sure you're familiar yes. with this. Santa Ana, of course, is uh, was the former Mexican general and leader over Mexico. And uh, after the whole Texas debacle, he kind of is in, in exile, if you will. Mm-hmm. So he comes and he makes this deal with Polk that if yes. Polk will reinstate him as the leader of Mexico, then he will peacefully negotiate this land over. And Polk does this. Santa Ana gets back down to Mexico, regroups his forces and then attacks them. Yeah. And a lot of people have said, well, was Polk foolish? Did, well, you know, was he just born yesterday? Or did Polk know this was going to happen? And he's basically allowing the fight to be instigated so he has military reason in order to evade Mexico. So is this a whole, like a double agent thing? It is could this a be. Play? That's a good, yeah, that's a very good uh, question to ask. You know, you know, I think Polk was very well aware of the the, the, the military might. He started the uh, the Naval Academy. Yes, he I did. Think he was, he, in Annapolis. He, yeah. Was yeah. it Annapolis at a time or did they move it later? I, I still don't remember that. I, I think, think it was, it was in Annapolis at the very beginning, yes. But uh, he, uh, I think he was well aware of the mil- military power of the United States and was itching to exercise it. Yes. Uh, and he did, and and now we have what we have. Yes. And uh, Zachary Taylor, of course, will, will push all the way down to Mexico City. Yes. And then here's what's really interesting. We talked Manifest Destiny. A large population of Congress and of the U.S. said annex all of it. Yeah. Take it all. And it's actually James K. Polk and his restraint that says, no, we don't deserve that. We're not going to take that. We're going to draw our, our boundary lines back. Real grand. And then we're going to even pay for reparations. So as much as we, we condone him for saying Manifest Destiny over, and he, he was. We're not, we're not condoning. We're not saying it's okay. Right. But as much as we 
look at that, he was not willing to take all of Mexico. He was not an invader, and he actually paid reparations when much of Congress said, we'll support you if you want to just take the whole country. Isn't that amazing? And he refuses to do that. Yes. So is there some scruples there in his life? Yes. I think each president shows that. I as, agree. As, as they become confronted with their own mortality and yes. legacy of this great nation and the understanding of the divine... Uh, a purpose of this great nation. And I'm glad you talked about that because, as you said, he, he began to deal with his own morality. So he he is a religious man. Yes. And, and I did a lot of research in this because, again, I, I teach a class in, in Christianity of, of politics throughout. So I did a lot of research in this. And his mom was devout Presbyterian, much like his wife. Mm -hmm. But his dad's not necessarily devout Presbyterian. So when uh, his parents take him to be baptized as an infant, as Presbyterians do, um, his mom is for it. The dad like basically comes to support, but the minister said they have to both be devout and the dad will not basically swear allegiance to the Presbyterian church. Wow. So they take little baby James K. Polk and will not have him baptized. I didn't know that. Yes. And then he'll grow up Presbyterian. And then he actually has a camp meeting that he attends when the early camp means the revivals, right. the stump preaching by a Methodist pastor by the name of John B. McFerrin. And he talked about the fact that this so impacted him that basically, I think it's when he got saved, that the Lord gripped his heart. And from then forward, he was secretly a Methodist but still as a Presbyterian name, so much so that when on his deathbed, he asked Reverend McFerrin to come back and to sprinkle him to baptize him on his deathbed because he wants to boldly be known as a follower of Jesus Christ. That's amazing. I yes. did not know that. So there's this whole like little intrigue of his religious life that plays yes. out. And after this camp meeting, after this revival he goes to, his heart begins to really burn towards the Lord. So he spends time in prayer daily. He actually, this is after he will write the idea that all his slaves will be freed upon his death. So I think the Holy Spirit begins to grip him that he knows slavery is wrong. It's yes. almost the Thomas Jefferson thing. It's the George right. Washington thing. They know right. it's wrong, but they don't want to deplete their family's bank. So they, they're valuing money more than freedom. I, I realize that. I'm not saying what he did was right. But you already begin to see, okay, this isn't right. And on my death and my wife's death, free all the slaves because he wants it to go this way. Amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. So I, I believe over and over again, two things that we, you and I have said over and over again is we see the changing power, first of all, the founding documents. Right. They allow us to change. And then you see that power of the Holy Spirit working in these men's lives. Yes. Yes. And I believe it brings incredible ch change. Especially on their deathbed, like you just pointed yes. out. It's interesting. You know, he was, like I said, he was in Congress for 14 years. And here's one of his quotes after he was president. He says, there is more selfishness and less principle among <laughs> members of Congress than I had any conception of before I became president of the U.S. I've read that before. And, and I think that is so fascinating because, you know, as a member of Congress, you think, well, by golly, it's those other, you know, offices, it's the executive branch, the judiciary, by, you know, if it weren't for the legislature, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have a good, and here he has been in Congress. He has been Speaker of the House, and then he becomes president, and he just says, there is nothing more selfish <laughs> than a member of Congress. And and I, after being living amongst them for 14 years. You can uh, attest to that, huh? Yes, yes. I, was it Adams who said that um, two fools make a law firm and three or more fools make a Congress? <laughs> yeah. I, I think it was Adams who made that statement. So, so it's, you know, disparaging members of Congress is nothing new, <laughs> you know? But we still need good ones. Yes, we do. We, 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 we greatly need that. He actually did not get along well with John Adams. John... Was John Adams kind of cracked too, because he serves as one, John Quincy Adams right. serves his one term as president, and then he serves, of course, in the House for the rest of his life. Correct. And he's kind of like, you remember watching the Muppets and those old men who sat up in the booth and just made fun of everyone? That was kind of like John Quincy Adams. He just kind of sat up in the booth and just made fun of everyone. Yeah. So talking about, uh, talking about this, this idea of, of who he was, he made this statement. He has no wit, no literature, no point of argument. No gracefulness or eloquence in delivery of language, no philosophy, nothing that constitutes oration, but confidence in his labor. That's amazing. So you see him just kind of calling him out. You see this idea that he doesn't really think that highly of Polk. Wow. And then Polk, of course, is, is, is recognized as a great orator. You yes, know? he and, was. And is that just because of his labor, because he could put on a good show? Was know. there any substance to what he was doing? According to John Quincy Adams, I guess not. Which John Quincy Adams was a bit of a snob. Yes. And he did not like Southern Democrats. That's at true. All. That's so true. there again, there's the partisan politics playing out here. Yeah. And Polk actually makes one of his really famous statements where he talks about this idea of partisan politics. And I wrote this down because I thought you'd find this really interesting. He said the passion for office and the number of unworthy persons who seek to live on the public, the public dime, is increasing beyond formal example. And I now predict that no president of the United States of either party will ever again be reelected. That is, they're all going to be one-term presidents. 
The reason is the patronage of the government will destroy the popularity of any president, however well their administrative was run. Yeah, I, I know he hated the, pre the patronage of the office of yes. presidency. He didn't like the fact that you had all this power, that you could appoint all these people, and that ultimately that would lead to the decline of a successive president. Mm -hmm. I think there still is issues. There are issues with regard to patronage and political appointments. Uh, and he was very astute to that, but he couldn't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. That was the, the one thing that I think that, that And he's partially bothered correct him. because Andrew yes, Jackson he's... serves two terms, and there will not be another two-term president until Lincoln. Yes. Which is not that he gets to serve both terms anyway. But you actually have this entire like this gap, the forgotten presidents, as you've called them. He's yeah. the best known of the forgotten presidents, or they're one-term kind of lame duck presidents. Yes, and he, by choice, was a one-term president. That's right. He runs on the promise that he will annex Texas, um, expand the land, cut the tariffs, yeah, cut and the bring tariffs. back the independent treasury, and then he's going to retire. He yep. does just that. He does just that, and four months later dies. Yeah. How many presidents actually say, I'm only going to run one term, I'm going to fulfill my campaign promises, and then I'm going to voluntarily step down? He does just that. He's probably, he reminds you of Washington. Yeah. Sir, two terms and then says, I'm done, I'm going to step down. And he does this. And that's a rare thing. You don't see a lot of politicians that do rare. that. Um, yeah. It's been said that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts, corrupts absolutely. absolutely. Yes. How hard is it to, to turn down those perks? And, and maybe you can even say from someone who served at Congress then to go back to the civilian world, that's got to be challenging. Well, it's a challenge because you, you, your ego drives a lot of people. You know, I think, I forget, uh, well, you know, I, I purposely only did eight years because I felt that uh, that was enough for me at the time. And I also felt that there was more I could do in life mm. that I couldn't accomplish while I was in Congress. And I'm fortunate that I've been able to, to pursue that career through, through my work here at Southeastern University. But I see people that, you know, serve. You know, I was I went to. Um, um, oh, um, the funeral for um, uh, Congressman Young. Uh, over in St. Petersburg, and he died in office, and he had served for 46 years. Wow. A great man in his own right. Uh, it cost him his marriage. Mm -hmm. It cost him the alienation of his, his children from his first marriage. Wow. It was quite the thing, and I, I, I told my wife, I said, I don't ever want to die in office. I think that that's, I, there, there's more to life than just mm -hmm. continuing to serve. And, and I think that might be something that James K. Polk saw that, that you know, and I think our founders saw that is yes. that, that this is an obligation for a period of time. It is not a career. That's good. And, and today's world, you know, you spend so much time and money getting in, you, you don't want to get out. Um, and but it's sometimes it seems out. like you owe so many favors. You have to stand just to repay the favors that you owe. Could be. Could be. I mean, I've seen, yeah. I've witnessed a few things that, that, that <laughs> I, I shake my head at. Yeah, well, I thought of the, the founding fathers is Washington who said that more than anything, he valued domestic tranquility. Amen. And I like that. He saw this as public service. He saw it like when you serve in the military, you serve as police, that you're serving and then you get out. I, I couldn't agree more. And we don't view it as service anymore. No. It's no longer that we're sac service involves sacrifice. Yes. Right? And political offices anymore, you're not sacrificing to serve. Now you're reaching the zenith of power to be served. So there's a flip of the idea of what the founding fathers even had in mind. Oh, there definitely is. I always tell my class, we got to go back and look at what history even was. The only reason why members of Congress were even paid was so they could leave their farms and actually go to D.C. and do yes. this job. It was never to be that they could go to D.C. and become wealthy off of this. They weren't, as, as, as Polk would say, they weren't to live off the dime That's of the true. individual. They were to serve and give back to yes. their country. And come back and, yeah, and enjoy we, domestic tranquility. We don't enjoy domestic tranquility. Um, I, I do like the fact that he lowered the tariff rate. So it was the Walker uh, Tariff Act of 18... 46, and he was a huge fan of, of free trade. So can that Adam yeah. Smith idea of that there should be free trade yeah. among the nations. And I find this interesting because free trade is something that is is shot down on both sides now. Uh, and, and this is interesting to me because if you look at the idea of, of course, NAFTA, a lot of Republicans tore it, you know, it's taking away jobs and this kind of thing. But if we honestly had an open free trade between countries, would that not increase our, our net economy in the long run? This is what Polk believed. And by the way, the, the economy actually recovered. Because yes. the economy had tanked yeah. uh, with Van Buren. Yep, 1837, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the, the two preceding after that, Tyler as well. But you actually find now where the economy booms from this. And tariff rates actually go up because he took almost all of them away. So now there's such an influx of, of, of goods coming Lower in. Lower rates, broader base, greater revenue. But that's not really agreed upon a lot on either no, side. No, it's not. It's <laughs> not at all because everybody wants their own fair playing field, you know. Fair. Exactly. <laughs> what a, you know, relative term. Yes. Yes. Wow. So as we look at this idea of James K. Polk, we find a man who is flawed in so many ways. Mm -hmm. So many ways. 
Um, the Trail of Tears were an atrocity to the indigenous people. Uh, slavery, which she continued to perpetrate, was an atrocity to, to minorities here in America. And yet at the same time, we see where he expanded and accomplished so much in four years. So we find a man who is a quandary, a man, yeah. when we come at the idea of goodness and greatness, he was not that good of a man, but he was a great man. He was. And he was, again, a Probably the right time, the right person for yes. the United States of America. So this has been James K. Polk, and we'll pick up with some of the unknown presidents next week. Thank, Thank you very you. much.